The Chinese Air Force is changing so quickly that keeping up with their breakneck pace is overwhelming. In this video, we will go through the structure of the Chinese Air Force, their inventory and their capabilities with an eye to the recent developments. And you will see there are plenty of similarities with Western Air Forces. This is a great idea, sir. I will contact all my friends who were assembled with me. And obviously, Otis is going to help. There is a People Liberation Army Air Force headquarters with a PLAF commander at the top of the structure. The current commander is General Chang Ding Kyu, a three star general. Then there is an administrative and logistic component chain of command and an operational chain of command. The PLAF top administrative components are four headquarters or departments, staff, logistics, equipment, and political. The first three are self explanatory and they are roughly equivalent to the United States Air Force commands, but they are less fragmented, covering more functions than the American equivalents. But we still have a political department, which is a remnant of the Soviet organization that was left behind a few decades ago. Uh, today surely does internal propaganda for the Chinese Communist Party, but its job is mostly PR nowadays. Reporting directly to the PLAF headquarters or to these departments, there are several units and organizations, like academies, universities, various other schools, test units, that in the Chinese system are called bases, research institutions, and the Blue Brigade. The 66 Blue Brigade is the PLAF aggressor unit. This is where all the PLAF aggressor activities are concentrated. They make use of a Chinese aircraft, but they replicate Western or, to a lesser extent, Indian tactics. This is where most of the Western consultants end up training the trainers. The brigade redeploys its elements across China as needed to attend the various training events that happen every year. They have an amazing patch where you can see the profile of North America in the background and a text in English that says the imaginary enemy of the Chinese Air Force. Definitely kudos for the sense of humor. Please note that a lot of the pictures and the information we have derived from Chinese enthusiasts publishing it on the internet. The political department keeps an eye on these pictures and provides a stream of official news, even managing part of a TV channel dedicated to the armed forces. This means that the stream of news and articles we see is sometimes of questionable reliability. And this is a situation where Ground News, which is sponsoring this video, becomes really useful. Ground News is a website and an app that gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world in one place, so you can compare how different outlets cover the same subject. Every story comes with a clear breakdown of the political bias, credibility, ownership, and then headlines of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. You can learn more by clicking my link, ground.news slash millennium, or scanning the QR code here. So, for example, let's take this story. Ukraine says China is key route for foreign tech in Russian weapons. Well, this is not exactly news, it's something that we already knew, so it was not covered by that many sources. If we click on the right, we see that, well, pretty much is the same as the summary. And if we click on the left, we at first sight see that is the same, but here we see this piece of news. For the first time, the Russians used the Chinese ZFB-05 armored vehicles in the war in Ukraine. This could be direct military support of the Chinese. So why there is no story about this? Well, if we look at this source, we understand that is a mixed factuality source. So we don't really know if you can trust it. And this is the case where ground news becomes very useful in telling factual news from other news that might not be that factual. Moreover, if you're interested to the conflict in general, Ground News also has specific subject pages to stay up to date, not only for Ukraine, but for many different subjects. 
Ground news is very important for my research since I try to be as factual and um, unbiased as I can about something that is often neither black nor white. Ground news helps me understand the bigger picture by providing comprehensive reporting from diverse sources. Now go to ground.news slash millennium or scan my QR code to subscribe today. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all the features. I think Ground News is doing a great job and I hope you'll check them out. Please support the people who support me. The operational component is based on five theater commands. The commands control the air bases, which are estimated to be about 150 all around China, and the brigades. A Chinese air brigade is smaller than a wing but larger than a squadron, with 30 to 40 aircraft. It is split in groups with 15 to 20 aircraft, or even fewer in case of special units. A group is a homogeneous unit with the same aircraft, but a brigade may have groups with different aircraft. And every brigade has a maintenance group. There are also regiments and battalions, but they are generally either bombers, special or support units, sometimes part of an air division. Combat forces, however, are generally organized as brigades and groups. There are about 65 to 70 major combat units, depending how do you want to count them. There are also two brigades and one regiment operating with large and long-range UAVs. Please note that the situation is fluid, the unit change and the PLAF doesn't publish its order of battle, even if it is not averse to enthusiasts publishing photos on the internet or naming some of the units when there is a particular reason. In the same way, the aircraft assigned change constantly because the Chinese are producing about 70 to 100 fighters every year and about the same amount of other major military aircraft. So take the information with a pinch of salt, particularly when it comes to the number of aircraft. Considering everything, the PLAF operates about 3,000 combat aircraft. This number includes new aircraft, old aircraft, bombers, transport, reconnaissance and so on. On top of these, there are about 1,000 trainers, some of them combat capable. However, the Chinese Air Force is still in transition, so the fraction of modern forces is smaller. If we exclude the various J7, J8, J11 and the older Su-27s, if we exclude the older variants of the J10 and the training dual-seaters, the number of modern aircraft is between 1,000 and 1100. About 120 are Su-30s and Su-35s of Russian origin, while all the others are Chinese original designs or heavily modified Chinese-built flanker variants. The most modern and potentially most effective aircraft in the inventory is the J-20, a fifth-generation fighter, of which from 210 to 250 units should be in service at the time of writing, with 8 to 10 brigades. However, its production and deployment numbers are contentious among the sources, so usual caveat applies. It features several similarities with Western designs, but the systems are believed to be entirely Chinese. Another fifth generation aircraft is in development. As of today, its designation is FC-31 and its development goes in parallel to a naval variant which is called the J-35. It's still early days, we don't know much. The J-10, while initially inspired by the never-built Israeli Lavi, it is a completely indigenous project. It is a multi-role aircraft, initially equipped with a melting pot of various foreign derivative systems, but the current variant, the J-10C, is equipped with Chinese-built systems and a modern AESA radar. In the air-to-air -air role, it carries all the very modern and very effective Chinese air-to-air -air weapons. In the air-to-ground role, it is still often seen with unguided weapons, but laser and satellite-guided bombs are becoming more and more common. It features a standoff missile, the KD-88, and it can also operate in the suppression of air defense role with the YJ-91 anti-radiation missile. The J-11 is a derivative of the Su-27, originally acquired from Russia in the early 90s. The J-11 is actually an 
unlicensed variant produced in China. The aircraft is currently being improved to the BG standard, which includes an indigenous AISA radar and other systems. A D variant, which was going to be a substantial modernization, has been abandoned, and its role seems to be mostly air-to-air. -air. The J-16 was derived from the J-11 as a dual-seater strike fighter. It is a multi-role aircraft, first entered service in 2015, which is a radical improvement on the original J-11. It features a modern AISA radar and modern Chinese systems, which are considered by many analysts more effective than the Russian systems acquired by the Chinese with the Su-35s and the Su-30s. It features the full Chinese panoply of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons, and it is sometimes dubbed the best flanker in the world. Flanker variants and J-10s form a sort of high-low mix with the J-20. Variants of all these three types are still in production, so it seems that the Chinese are happy with this configuration. And here you can see another parallel. The J-10 is an F-16 equivalent, the J-16 an F-15E equivalent, and the J-20 an F-22 equivalent. So the Chinese inventory is a stratification of historical acquisitions, like it often happens, that tells the story of the progressive growth of the Chinese defense and aerospace industry. This happened at a breakneck pace in less than three decades. How did they do it? It's a fascinating story, but it is for another time. Now we need to have a look at another piece of Chinese air power. China is one of the remaining three countries with a proper bomber fleet in service, the other two being Russia and the United States. The Chinese fleet is based on the H-6 bomber. It may seem the old 216 Badger, and it is indeed a derivative, but the aircraft in service are built in China, and they have very little in common with the original, but the general configuration. There are about 200 H-6 in service, of which about 100 are the modern digitalized H-6K variant. This is a versatile aircraft capable of using a vast panoply of weapons against ground and naval targets. There are various other variants specialized for electronic warfare, launching cruise missiles or ISR. The capability of this aircraft of launching mass attacks with cruise supersonic or aeroballistic missiles is considered one of the main Chinese force projection capabilities. Well, so far is been scouting, but the effectiveness of an air force depends on several factors. Some can detract from its force, some others can multiply it. Nowhere training is as essential as in air combat operations. Poor planning and shoddy execution can nullify every technology and performance advantage. Chinese training used to be bad, and I mean very bad, but everything has changed in the last two decades. I keep seeing reports of Western tactics being adopted and complex missions being flown. The best and most experienced Chinese pilots today go to the aggressor brigade to spread and diffuse their knowledge. Training facilities inspired to the flags exercises have been built. Electronic warfare is always included in these scenarios. They have recently changed their syllabus to expand the base of available pilots, shortening and condensing the years of theoretical training and expanding the practical training. The PLAF is trying to train with other air forces that have connections with the West, like the Royal Thai Air Force or the Pakistani Air Force, to better gauge their relative strengths and weaknesses. The Chinese did not have any recent combat experience, and their armed forces are untested. This is a problem they are acutely aware of, and this ramp up in training methodologies is seen as a way of mitigating it. Because the key point is, as usual, that you can't just start a war uh, to test your armed forces in real operations. Nobody in his rightful mind would do that. Logistic is another area where the Chinese are moving very quickly. They have the advantage that the PLAF is geared toward fighting local wars, not toward power projection everywhere in the world. Every brigade or regiment has a maintenance group, and there are 21 main maintenance centers on Chinese mainland for what we would call depot maintenance. 
Chinese logistic effort in the last two decades has been focused on the digitalization of the supply chain in a way not that much different from what has happened in the civilian sector. There is not much documentation on this aspect, but it seems that now they are focusing on real-time data and predictive maintenance. Something similar to the Digital Transformation Initiative of the US Air Force. It may seem boring, but the capacity of generating sorties rests on readiness. That is, the capacity of the entire logistic chain to put armed aircraft in the air. The mere availability of, well, anything in the inventory doesn't mean that the job could actually be done. The PLAF doesn't publish statistics about its readiness, and this is one of the main knowledge black holes that we have, at least in the open source. I may have a way to fix the problem, sir. Is it legal? Well, sir, then I believe I will send back the box. What, 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 what do you mean? Artis, what, what do you mean? <sighs> So I assure everyone who is watching that I don't have any piece of information which is not in the public domain, but I may have missed something, so let me know in the comments below if you have seen any news about it. Then, at a more operational level, China has also invested in other capabilities and force multipliers. One area that has seen a lot of development is electronic warfare, electronic intelligence and airborne early warning. So, like the US, China has developed its own electronic attack variants of existing fighters. The first one is the JH-7A. This is the first Chinese combat aircraft, mostly, but not entirely, of indigenous design. It entered service at the end of the 90s as an attack aircraft, sort of roughly in the same class of the Tornado or the Su-24. About 200 are still in service in the PLAF, and while they may be considered second-line aircraft by now, they still retain some useful capabilities. And this is particularly the case when it comes to electronic warfare. In fact, the aircraft can carry two electronic attack pods. It can also target and launch the YJ-91, which is a derivative of the Russian KH-31, and the LD-10, which is the anti-radiation variant of the PL-12. It actually seems that the units still equipped with the JH-7A are progressively specializing into the electronic attack role, which, at least in numerical terms, is definitely not a negligible force. The Chinese have also developed an electronic attack variant of the flanker, the J-16D, with wingtip integrated ECM pods, but there are only 12 in service, so we don't know why they are apparently not replacing the JH-7A. Anyway, they are the basis for the electronic warfare variant of the J-15 for the Chinese Navy and carrier use. Anyway, naval aviation is out of scope for this video, so we move on. In any case, regular J-16s can carry electronic warfare pods, so they do not depend entirely on the older JH-7. Moreover, a variant of the J-10 has been identified with a large spine, which is believed to be an electronic warfare variant, but we haven't seen any development on that front yet. But even less known are the about 20 electronic warfare aircraft based on the Y-8 and Y-9 airframes. Y-8 is a turboprop transport aircraft derived from the Antonov-12. It is an extremely versatile aircraft and there are endless variants, for military and civilian use as well. Much modernized since the original variant, it is still in production today. And the Y-9 is a stretch variant of the Y-8, which entered service in 2010 with improved engines, propellers and a modern cockpit. And so we have a Y8DZ, which is a signal intelligence platform, a Y8CM, which is an electronic countermeasure variant. Then we have the Y8GX, which has been built in various sub-variants for electronic communication jammings, electronic intelligence, and it is also working as an airborne command post. Three additional Y8T are designed as airborne national command posts together with Quite surprisingly, three transformed Boeing 737. Even less known is the fact that China operates an equivalent of the J-STARS aircraft. The Chinese have acquired a number of Tupolev 154M 
from Russia during the years. Today it is considered a rapidly aging airliner, but the Chinese modified four of them to deploy a synthetic aperture array. It seems that they keep constantly developing these aircraft, of which just two photos exist. In one it is clearly visible a canoe under the fuselage, which has the classical shape to host the antenna of a synthetic aperture radar uh, to map ground targets. In the other picture, though, the canoe is replaced with various radooms of different sizes. This is another intriguing unknown of the Chinese Air Force. The area that has seen the most development, though, is airborne early warning. The first successful iteration of a Chinese AWACS was the KJ-200 in the early 2000s. Four or five of them are in service today. It doesn't have a disc but two arrays back to back. It was built on the Y8 airframe, but it wasn't satisfactory. The project of the KJ-2000, based on the Illusion 76 airframe, started soon after, featuring three arrays in a triangular arrangement inside the disc. Four of them are in service today. The problem, though, in this case, was the cost and the availability of the Illusion 76 airframes from Russia. The model that seems to be best suited to the PLAF is the KJ-500. It is based on the Y9, it features the same triangular arrangement inside the disc, 20 units have been built and it is seen as the standard aircraft for airborne early warning, with the KJ-200 and the KJ-2000 relegated in secondary roles. Another force multiplier I would like to cover is the Chinese tanker fleet, because this is an area where there is a lot of room for improvement. The Chinese have no more than 26 tankers at the moment. 15 of them are variants of the H6 bomber, which have a long range, but they do not really carry too much fuel to distribute. Three Russian Illusion 78 have been acquired as a stopgap measure, but the Chinese in this day and age want to be autonomous. So more recently, the YY-20 enters service based on the Y-20 transport. It preserves the transport capacity, it has a very long range, also can carry up to 90 tons of fuel to distribute. The production is ongoing, but it is somehow slow, so we might see a slow increase of the tanker fleet. Despite the fact that the Chinese do not have the same expeditionary requirement of the Americans, areas like the Second Island Chain or the Southern China Sea are remote enough to require in-flight refueling to operate. The modest fleet in existence today is not sufficient to guarantee a high tempo or large-scale operations in these areas for aircraft based on the mainland. There is a lot left to discuss. We did not cover the air defenses that are part of the Air Force. We did not cover the naval aviation. We did not cover the ever-increasing unmanned capabilities. And we left out plenty of details. However, this is by no means the last video on the channel dedicated to the Chinese Air Forces. Actually, some critics say that I give too much attention to non-Western aircraft, but these are already well known. There is not much point to give the usual shallow description again. I cover them when there is something interesting to say. So thank you very much for giving me your attention. I consider this a privilege and a honor. An outsized thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member or by any other of the possible means. Today you can also use a GoFundMe fundraiser which is actually connected to a book that I am trying to prepare. If you're interested, please see all the links in the description below. But if you can support the channel, which is perfectly fine, absolutely fine, please Subscribe or interact in any way with the channel itself by liking, leaving a comment and so on. This helps with the algorithm and it can be decisive. So, this is the end. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.